Heavenly Father, we thank you for this another day that thou hast given us all our manifold blessings to us and all coming to us and in through the Lord Jesus Christ, who, though he was rich, yet for our sakes he became poor, that we, through his poverty, might be rich. We thank thee for the richness, the fullness, the wonderfulness of being in the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all thy blessings come to us. We pray that thou wouldst once again bless us through an understanding of the truth as opposed to the lie, so that we might be better enabled to serve thee and further sanctify. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Um, we are still looking at... Oh, by the way, Heidi, um, click on your mic icon and it will... Um, Mute it, and then when I call on you, ask you a question, then you can click on it again and unmute it. Jake, I think yours is unmuted. Yeah, I thought I muted it, but it looks like it's not. Okay, perfect. It's good now. All right, we're still looking at Galatians 4 and verse 27. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren, that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. This verse is a little bit difficult to understand because of the, uh, the antithesis which resides in it, and that is that the barren are indeed the fruitful. And those who have many children are those who have no children. So we look once again at Luther's word. By the way, for those of you who are new, we are using Martin Luther's commentary on Galatians because it is perhaps not only the best commentary ever written on the book, but perhaps the best commentary ever written on any book. That's my opinion of it. So he says, But thou wilt say, I do nothing. Thou canst do nothing, whereby thou mayest be delivered from the tyranny of the law. But hear this joyful tidings, which the Holy Ghost bringeth unto thee out of the words of the prophet. Rejoice thou that art barren. As if he would say, Why art thou so heavy? Why dost thou so mourn, since there is no cause why thou shouldest do so? For But I am barren and forsaken, etc. Well, although thou be never so barren and forsaken, not having the righteousness of the law, notwithstanding Christ is thy righteousness, he was made a curse for thee to deliver thee from the curse of the law. If thou believe in him, the law is dead unto thee. And look how much Christ is greater than the law. So much hast thou a more excellent righteousness than the righteousness of the law. Moreover, thou art fruitful and not barren. For thou hast many more children than she which hath an husband. So, uh, Luther is saying, Christ was made a curse for thee to deliver thee from the curse of the law. If thou believe in him, the law is dead unto thee. In what sense is it true to say that Christ was made a curse for us? What's the answer, Jake? Right, and the idea behind the cross is that, well, the, the idea behind that form of execution, why was it that they didn't behead somebody? Why is it that they didn't, of course they didn't have guns at the time, but put them, put them in front of a firing squad or shoot an arrow through their heart? The reason was that they considered that these people were so heinous the, those who were chosen for, 
for this form of execution, which is crucifixion, were considered so heinous that they would pollute the earth if they died with their feet touching the earth. That's the idea behind the cross, that they died hanging between heaven and earth. Um, and also that they had to take them down before sunset. So um, Christ was made a curse because that tells us that we were the curse. Was made a curse in our place. In what sense are we cursed by nature? Kenneth. In the sense that we have the guilt of Adam's sin imputed to us. Exactly. Not only, it's not only the idea that we perform certain actions which causes God to be angry with us, which is true. That's that's the superficial, or the well, I wouldn't say superficial. That's the, uh, the secondary nature of our problem. The primary nature is that we are that which God cannot abide by nature. We ourselves are cursed, not just our actions. And then he says, to deliver thee from the curse of the law. And then, secondly, what is the curse of the law? Larry, the curse of the law. Is it not because we are condemned? Yeah. It can, uh, well, look at... Galatians 3.10 and read it. For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do that. Okay. This is the key verse on the understanding as to how is it that the law is a curse. For as many as are of the works of the law are... And notice, I think you read it wrong unless I heard it wrong because it doesn't say for as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse but it says what? All right. I apologize. I had the wrong version. <laughs> you had the wrong version. Yeah. Hey, there. Once again, um, did you yeah. see my post on Shakespeare? We need to have a new and improved version of Shakespeare, don't we? That terrible English. These guys. Those guys didn't know Shakespeare. Didn't know how to speak. So. Garrett's raising his thumb. Garrett knows you had the wrong version too, I think. <laughs> all right. Or under the curse. What is the curse? Well, Kenneth just hinted at it. The curse is that not only are you bound for hell owing to your individual transgressions, but you yourself are the essence of what God cannot abide. But that's not what we're talking about now. What we're talking about now is how is it true to say that the law, the curse of the law, how is the law a curse? Well, what he just read tells us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. So, the law is a curse because it shows, well, what does it mean to be under the law? Kenneth, explain that to us. To be under the law simply means that your relationship to God is determined by your performance in keeping the law. See that? And man is born believing what about himself? He's born, but... Go ahead. That he is basically a good person. Right. And able. See that? And so the law 
rather than being a blessing to him is a curse to him because he thinks he thinks that's the man the manual through which obedience thereunto is your form of getting brownie points whereas in reality what is it Kenneth Of right. Uh, uh, the, the first use of the law is to show you that you can earn no brownie points. And in fact, everything you've ever done has taken you further from God. There is also, the next paragraph, there is also another abolishment of the law which is outward to wit that the politic laws of Moses do nothing belong unto us. Wherefore, we ought not to call them back again, nor superstitiously, superstitiously bind ourselves unto them, as some went about to do in times past, being ignorant of this, this liberty. Now, although the gospel make us not subject to the judicial laws of Moses, yet notwithstanding, it doth not exempt us from obedience of all politic laws, but politic laws, in other words, uh, the laws of the state that will go to Romans 13 and you'll see that all authority has been given of God. And so the fact that we have society, did somebody just think up, oh, I think, well, I think, I think I need somebody to tell me what to do. <laughs> Knowing who you are by nature, you would never think of that. A society is something given to us by God for order. God is not the author of confusion, but maketh us subject in this corporal life to the laws, there it is, what I was just saying, to the laws of that government wherein we live. That is to say, it commandeth everyone to obey his magistrate in laws, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. First Peter 2, Romans 13, as we just mentioned, Romans 13, the emperor or any other prince should not offend if he used some of the judicial laws of Moses, yea, he might use them freely and without offense. Therefore, the popish schoolmen are deceived, which dream that the judicial laws of Moses are pernicious and deadly since the coming of Christ. And what is that a form of? Let me read that again. Who, who, who believes such as that? That the judicial laws of Moses are pernicious. And deadly since the coming of Christ. What's that a form of, Jake? Well, it's a form of there it is. That's exactly what they believe. Oh, no, no, no. No, we're, we're not subject to the law. We're not subject to the Decalogue. Uh, likewise, we are not bound to the ceremonies of Moses, much less to the ceremonies of the Pope. But because this bodily life, you see now he's, now, he's, now he's switching to the conscience. As far as, insofar as the conscience is concerned, uh, Kenneth, explain this to us in a second. Insofar as the conscience is concerned, we're not bound uh, to the laws of Moses. Meaning what? Kenneth. Yes. Yeah, you're breaking up. Oh, meaning that the, the gospel belongs to the conscience and the law to the flesh. Right. To our, to our deportment on earth. But as far as the conscience is concerned, which is in, what do we mean by, by the word conscience? Because Luther uses it again and again and again and again. And how many times have we used it? What does youth... What does, you have to be clear about this. What does, what does Luther always refer to when he uses that word conscience? Kenneth. Uh, the gospel. Right. Our relationship to God has absolutely nothing to do with the law. But that's what you're tempted to do when you think, Right. That's what we said, the devil is going to come into your mind. Somebody just criticized me about that. Well, you're criticizing Luther. 
And basically, scripture, because hey, that's exactly what's going to happen on your deathbed. Uh, the enemy's going to come in and, and, and do what, Kenneth? Tempt you to do what? The enemy will tempt you to, as he always does, think in terms of works religion and think, uh, think of how many uh, good things you've done. Or how many exactly. Things you've done. Look at all the brownie points that you've earned. Uh, to stand before God. You're damned because you, under that last temptation, the the last temptation of Christ, how about the last temptation of the Christian? (laughs) There it is. Uh, To think that, well, after all, I've been a good, pretty good person and so I should be... No, the Christian reminds himself that his only hope is in Christ. The death and the perfect righteousness of Christ. So he says, we are not bound to the ceremonies of Moses, much less to the ceremonies of the Pope. But because this bodily life cannot be altogether without ceremonies or rites, for there needs be some instruction. Therefore the gospel suffereth ordinances to be made in the church as touching days, times, places. In other words, okay, so what he's saying. uh, What time do you meet? Well, well, we happen to meet 7 o'clock in the morning, the Lord's day. But it's not 7 o'clock in the morning your time. It's 7 o'clock if you're on the East Coast. 7 o'clock p.m. Saturday. That's what he's saying. There has to be some kind of order. But why do we meet at 7 a.m.? Is is there some uh, biblical passage? No. That's what he's talking about. That the people may know upon what day and what hour and in what place to assemble. Why do we meet on Saturday? uh, Why are we meeting right now at this time? That's just a decision. To hear the word of God, etc. It permitteth also that lessons and readings should be appointed as in the schools, especially for the instruction of children and such as are... There you go, the catechism. Ignorant. These things it permitteth to the end that all may be done comely and orderly in the church. 1 Corinthians 14. And not, What's he talking about? 1 Corinthians 14. We're going to be using that tomorrow. Huh? God is not the author of confusion. 14.33. Not that they which keep such ordinances do thereby merit remission of sins. That's a far be it from us to ever think that. Moreover, they may be changed. In other words, the time we meet, etc. How long we meet omitted without sin so that it be done without offense of the weak. Neither is it true that the ceremonies of Moses after the revelation of Christ are deadly. Else had the Christians sinned in observing the feasts of Pasch and Pentecost, which the old church instituted by the example of Mosaic law, albeit in a far other manner and to a far other end. Now Paul speaketh here especially of the abolishment of the moral law, which is diligently to be considered. For he speaketh against the righteousness of the law that he might establish the righteousness of faith. What does he mean by that, Gary? He speaketh against the righteousness of the law that he might establish the righteousness of faith. In other words, the righteousness of the law is not only incorrect, but it is an obstacle to understanding and believing the righteousness of faith. In what sense? What would be that by by faith I am Um, well, can you compare and contrast the righteous, first of all, what's the righteousness of the law? Secondly, what's the righteousness of faith? The righteousness right. of the law means what? Right, the righteousness of the law which I cannot perform, which I cannot maintain, right. as opposed to the righteousness of Christ that is right. imputed to me by faith. Exactly. So, so far from it being true to say that you can reconcile yourself or recommend yourself to God through the keeping of the moral law I say so far from its being true that it is exactly the opposite meaning what Kenneth Uh, every component of the law damns you right we're going to get to that in a few minutes so uh, the law not only is not your friend, it's your enemy. 
Well, the law is not your enemy. The, 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 the thinking, as Luther talks about the conscience, the thinking that the law is your friend insofar as it gives you one, two, three, four, five uh, manual and how to earn brownie points with God. So, it's not the righteousness of the law, but it is the righteousness of faith. The, 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 right, the, the, the law is our friend in the sense that it tells us we cannot earn brownie points and drives us to the righteousness of faith. And con uh, concluding thus, if only grace or faith in Christ justify, then is the whole law abolished without... Isn't that beautiful? If only, if it is true to say that it is only grace or faith in Christ that justifies then is the entire law abolished without any exception. That's the antithesis. You see that, Larry? What does he mean? If we're going to just have faith and believe in Christ, then it's all or not because we're not justified in Christ. What he's saying is this. If it is true, and it is, that only grace or faith in Christ justify us, then is the whole law abolished without any exception. See, this is the importance of understanding the English language. Because otherwise you trip up and go right into hell. He's not saying that the law is abolished in an absolute sense. Right, Kenneth? Yes, but uh, with explicit reference to our justification. Exactly. That's what the sentence says. That's what the context is. You have to understand what the context is. If only grace or faith in Christ, as far as justification is concerned, once again the conscience, then is the whole law with respect to the conscience, with respect to justification, is abolished without any exception. Get it out of here. Get that stuff out of my face as far as my justification is concerned. I'm justified. What is justification? Ellie. <laughs> she got to that one, right? What is justification? Justification is an act of God's free grace wherein he pardons all our sins and accepts us in righteousness and sight only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and received by faith and love. Only for the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and receive by faith. Get that law out of here. I'm justified through faith in Christ's perfect keeping of the law. And this he confirmeth by the testimony of Isaiah, whereby he exhorteth the barren and free keepers. In other words, verse 27 is a quotation. It's taken from the uh, revelation of Isaiah, whereby he exhorteth the barren and forsaketh, and for the barren and forsaken. To rejoice, for it seemeth the forsaken. We're the forsaken ones, right? As far as the Calvinists are concerned, we're already marginalized. Look at these guys. You and who else believe what you do? There it is, same thing. For it seemeth she has no child, nor hope ever to have any. That is to say, she had no disciples, no favor, nor countenance of the world. Because she preacheth the word of the cross of Christ crucified against all the wisdom of the flesh. Remember the two theologians in the Heidelberg Dispensations? Kenneth, do you remember that? He talked about, there are two theologians. Uh, the, the theologian of blank and the theologian of blank. Remember what it was? We talked about this before. The theologian, the theologian of the cross, which is he's talking about here, and the theologian of glory. You see it? Theologian of the cross and the theologian of, uh, well, if you, if you pay now, six months in advance, we'll give you $100 off your, uh, <laughs> your uh, conference fee. Theologian of glory. As opposed to theologian of the cross. I love it. 
Uh, you guys have an opportunity to read those Heidelberg dispensations. Uh, dis not dispensation. <laughs> dispensation. Wow. Heidelberg disputations. But thou that art barren, said the prophet, let not this any wit trouble thee. Don't let it bother you. You're marginalized. Of course you are. You're nothing. We're everything. Who are you? You, you and your three other people. Yea, rather lift up thy voice and rejoice. For she that is forsaken hath more children than she that hath an husband. That is to say, she that is married and hath a great number of children shall be made weak. And thou that art forsaken shall have many children. This is really interesting. I was in a, this happened to me on more than one occasion. I started saying things. I was in this OPC um, group online. I started saying things they didn't want to hear. So they suddenly came up with a, with, with a uh, condition uh, under which <laughs> belonging to the group must be stipulated. In other words, here was the condition. Okay, you have to give us uh, the names of three of your elders and the name of the church that you're a member of. Otherwise, you can't be a member of the, of the group. Now, it could be a Baptist church, it could be an Episcopalian church, it could be, but see what I'm saying? Same exact thing Luther is saying right here. Uh, that hath an husband, there it is. That is to say, she that is married and hath a great number of children shall be made weak, and thou that art forsaken shall have many children. He calleth the church barren because her children are not begotten by the law. There it is. Don't you love it? By works, by any industry or endeavor of man, but by the word of faith in the Spirit of God. And what is the word of faith in the Spirit of God referred to? Jake, not this, but that. You see the antithesis? Our children are not begotten by the law, by works, by any industry or endeavor of man, but by the word of faith in the Spirit of God. What does that mean? The word of faith in the Spirit of God. Um, the word of faith in the Spirit of God. Um, well, I mean, is it um, uh, faith brought in, uh, in, in faith in, in grace alone that's brought about by the Spirit? Of God? Yep, exactly. The word of faith meaning. The object of your faith is Christ. What is the Arminian's object of his faith? Britain. They don't have faith in Christ. They have faith in what? Uh, in themselves. Right. Or they have faith in their faith. In other words, they believe, see it? They believe that the difference between heaven and hell is not what Christ did because Christ did just as much for those in hell as for those in heaven. They believe that the difference between heaven and hell is not what Christ did. It's what you do with what he did. You're the star of the show. You do have to be a star, baby, to be in our show. <laughs> Billy Davis and Marilyn McCoo. <laughs> I think that's who it was. And uh, <laughs> he, uh, interestingly enough, they were supposed to be what they call born-again Christians. But by the word of faith in the Spirit of God, the word of faith in Christ and the Spirit of God, you have to believe in the Spirit because you've been convinced that you are bereft of any ability to reconcile yourself to God. There is nothing else but being born. No working at all. Isn't that beautiful? There's nothing else but being born. Hey, being born. We've heard that so many times that we don't realize that being born is not only not something that you do, but is completely passive voice. Kenneth, you got that? Being born means what? What's the verb? Well, be, <laughs> being as a helping verb, 
But born is the past, uh, um, what do you say? Past participle of the verb to bear, right? Being born of your mother. That's what that means. You are born. You don't bear yourself. Lost my place. Yeah. Is here is nothing else but but being born. No working at all. You see that? That is so beautiful. Where does that come from? That comes from John 3. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. So far from it being true that Christ was telling Nicodemus what he needed to do to reconcile himself to God. Far from that being the truth, the exact opposite was the case. Meaning what, Kenneth? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah, he need, what he needed to do was to despair utterly of himself. Right. So far from him giving a... a, 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 a What's the word I'm looking for? A formula, right? He was saying, you have, hey, Nicodemus, you want to know what you must, have, you have undone yourself by your doing and you still want to do. You must be, something must be done to you, not by you, not from you. No working at all. Contrary was, that's where we talk about the first half of the, Epistles of the New Testament, doctrine. Second half is practice. What is the false gospel? Where does the false gospel put practice? Jake? Um, well, the false gospel uh, puts uh, practice as, as meritorious. And, All right. Uh, yeah. In the forefront. All right. They put doctrine in the forefront. And and get this, mark this down if you have to put it down in your notes. Legalism always results in antinomianism. You see how we got that from this passage, from what he's saying? Legalism always results in antinomianism. The legalism of Billy Graham in the 40s and 50s turned out to be the antinomianism of his son, Franklin Graham. And his grandson, isn't this interesting? Who was Billy Graham's grandson? Who is Billy Graham? He's not dead. Kenneth, who's his grandson? What's his name? <laughs> You're lucky. You're lucky. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know what his name is. Talian Chavigian. Oh, What's God. Talian? Hey, get this, people. Write it down. This is not a coincidence. Tullian Chavigian's doctrine is called hypergrace. What's hypergrace? Jake, have you heard of it? <clears throat> well, I think it's I think it's just uh antinomianism. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. That's why they call it hypergrace. It's all grace. Well, hey. Yeah, of course that's of course that's where he ends up. That's where hyper grace, well, so called hyper grace. We believe that it's all of grace. At the same time, we don't say it's all of grace, but we believe it's all of grace. Therefore, um, the Holy Spirit causes you to work, but the false gospel of Arminianism places the works at the forefront. And the inevitable consequence is always antino... Just give it time. Just give it time. Uh, legalism always morphs into antinomianism. Contrary wise, they did a fruitful labor and exercise themselves with great travail and bearing and bringing forth. And here it is all together working in no birth. Because they endeavor to get the right of children and heirs by the righteousness of the law or by their own righteousness, they are servants and never receive the inheritance. No. Though they tire themselves, they are servants. See, if, if, if your concept is works, 
Here's the one thing they never ask. The devil will never allow a legalist to ask this question. What am I thinking of? Maybe nobody's thought of it because you don't think exactly the way I do, but, <laughs> but it's so important. What question will the devil never allow a legalist to ask, which is necessary for him to ask? Jake, you know what I'm thinking of? Here it is. Since I have to do, how much do I have to do, right? Yeah, it's okay. It's okay to believe that you can earn brownie points with God as long as you don't ask this question. How many brownie points do I have to, to perform to be accepted by God? The devil will not allow you to ask that question. He'll keep you from that question. Because as soon as you ask that question, where are you then, Kenneth? You're at Job 25.4, right? How then can a man, seeing the demand of God, Matthew 5.48, be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. How then can a man be just with God? Never receive the inheritance, no, they, though they tire themselves to death with continual travail. For they go about to obtain that by their own works against the will of God, which God of His mere grace will give to all believers for Christ's sake. The faithful work will also, but they are not thereby made sons and heirs. The faithful, yeah, I've read that wrong. The faithful work will also, but they are not thereby made sons and heirs. For this their birth bringeth, for this their birth bringeth unto them. See, the regeneration, which is immediately followed by faith, brings unto us. But this they do to the end that they may that they being now made children for Christ's sake might glorify God by their good works and help their neighbors. There you go. We'll stop right there for next week. This, I hope you guys are rejoicing. This is so beautiful. I mean, it's, 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 there's nothing more beautiful than what we're reading, what we're talking about, what we're discussing. This is everything. Okay. We're talking about now, uh, which question are we on, Gary? Catechism. Exactly. What is forbidden in the third commandment? And the very first thing, what happened to you, Jamie? Click on your camera. We lost you. What happened? Sorry, I was taking care of my niece. Oh, okay. So, uh, what is forbidden in the third commandment? First and foremost, what we talked about last week. What is the very first thing? that you must think when you look at the third commandment, which is what we're dealing with now. We said this last week, so we're going to repeat ourselves. What's the very first thing that the third commandment tells you, Jamie? Remember what we said? I believe you said it, it shows forth like your sinfulness. Exactly. Specifically in general. But specifically, it tells you that you've never kept the third commandment. Right? So, and if you've never kept the third commandment, specifically, you've never done what? We're talking about in your conversion, when you come face to face with the law, and specifically with the third commandment. It tells you that you've never done what? Specifically, Jamie. In the third commandment, you said? Yeah, we're dealing with the third commandment. Specifically, when we say you've never kept it, that means you've never done what? Oh, you never kept any of them. Well, but we're, we're speaking of the third in particular. 
I'm not sure. Okay. What is the third commandment? What is required in the third commandment? Third commandment requires what? A holy and different use of God's names, titles, attributes, ordinances, words, and works. Right. So, the third commandment tells you that you've never respected the name of God. How so? Jamie, what were you like before conversion? What was your relationship to the name of God? Oh, I didn't have a relationship. Right. You hated everything you heard about God, you hated. Uh, but you deceived yourself into thinking that you didn't hate the name of God because you didn't know God. Sort of like uh, I was reading this guy one time and he said, there, there, he wrote a sermon, uh, the title of the sermon, oh yeah, the title of the sermon was Men Are By Nature God's Enemies. And he was get, listing different reasons why the average person doesn't think that he holds God as, an in, as his enemy. And he gave the illustration of a, of a pit viper coiled up and he seems so peaceful until you hit him with your hand and then he shows his fangs. The reason why people don't think that they hate God is God has never troubled them yet. As soon as he troubles them with disease or bad circumstances, debt, problems, then they show their fangs against God. So, the very first thing the third commandment tells us is that we've never kept it. I was just thinking just before I was meditating on the lesson today, before we started, does anybody know, unless you've heard me say this, you don't know because I've never heard anybody else say it, but it's as, uh, it's as logical as logic can possibly be. Do you know the, basically, I don't know if this is true to the nth degree, but basically, the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, you used to not be able to say the word damn on air. Now you can't. You used to not be able to, when I was a kid, you could not say the word hell over the, over the airwaves. No, you can now. You used to not be able to use F-bombs. And you still can't. Tiger Woods has been fined again and again and again and again for F-bombs. Right? Every time you use one, you get fined because they tell you beforehand, hey, you got a microphone on you. These are the words you can't use over the airways because we're going to get, CBS is going to be fined and we're going to pass that on to you. All right, what, what's my next question? Jake, what's my next question? Well, no, that's the, that's the question after this one. <laughs> the next question is this. How come F-bombs are still forbidden? We're the only people who know. The only people in the universe. Hey, ask, ask politicians. Ask the FCC. They know you can't use it, and they will enforce it, but they don't know why, and here's why it is. What's the, what is forbidden in the Third Commandment? Larry, read it. Third Commandment forbidden. All... What does it say? Third Commandment forbidden. Forbidden all profaning or abusing of anything whereby God maketh himself... All profaning and abusing of anything whereby God maketh himself known... God maketh himself, the reason why F-bombs are forbidden is God maketh himself known in his covenant. There it is. God saves his people in the line of continued generations. And so, F-bombs are forbidden. Hey, why not any other bodily function? How about sneezing? Can you say sneeze on the air? Yes. Can you say cough on the air? Can you say eat on the air? Can you say defecate? I mean, any bodily function. What makes that one so special? Because it is holy. Because 
God's people are holy. Because of 1 Corinthians 7, 14. Read that. Britain. Read it. There you go. They're holy. Your children are holy because you, because of the doctrine of the covenant. Now, does it say every one of your children, if you're a Christian, does it say every one of your children is going to be born again? Britain, yes or no? No, it does not. No, and it doesn't mean that. By virtue of this action. Yes. You are holy. And that word is holy. So you can't say it on air. Now, is it going to go by the way? Yes. Most certainly. You will be able to use that word in the future. Over the air. Oh yeah. No question. But not now. And we are the only people. What an opportunity we have, right? What an opportunity we have to explain to the world. Anybody you want to talk to. Ask them that question. How come that word is forbidden over the airways? They don't know. We know. Because all profaning and abusing of anything whereby God maketh himself known. Has God made himself known as the covenant God? Kenneth, yes or no? Yes, indeed. Yeah. How many genealogies are found in the Bible? One, two, three. You can't hardly read anywhere without reading a genealogy. Kenneth, what is that telling us? Just one, really. What's that? Just one, really, Adam to Christ. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> but you see, every, next time, I, I, um, I heard of a book, this has been about, what, 30 years ago, but I, even at the time, when I was so confused myself. But I couldn't believe anybody would entitle... This is the title of the book. How to Enjoy the Boring Parts of the Bible. <laughs> hey, Heidi, what do you think about that title? That, sound, that sounds like one of my books. <laughs> How do you hey. Say that again? Reading all the begats. I heard a story one time about a pastor that was called into a rest home and an old fella asked him to read from scripture and the, the area that he picked was the three or four I from the reading all the begats. Who we got to. Right. And the, the pastor made it through it three or four hours. And then he asked the old man, what that? He said, just think of it. If God knows all those people's names, he knows you. Well, <laughs> there's, no, there's no unimportant word at all in God's word. Well, that's one part of it. But what we're speaking about specifically is that whenever you read a genealogy in Scripture, you should be thinking this. God saves His people in the line of continued generations. That is so important. He won't let you forget it. And what, hey, so which brings the next question. Um, Jamie. What do you think a Baptist thinks when he reads these genealogies? <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, here's what he thinks. Well, maybe I should write a book and entitle it How to Enjoy the Boring Parts of the Bible. <laughs> it's the essence of boredom. They don't understand anything about it. So, but specifically... We're um, dealing with the, uh, where are my notes here? 
So, what is forbidden in the third commandment? All profaning and abusing of anything whereby God maketh himself known. And so, I think of Psalm 96, 119, I think it's Psalm, this verse just popped into my head. Psalm 119, 96, is that right? Yeah, read that one. Jamie, Psalm 119, 96. Yeah, Psalm 11996. I have seen an end of all perfection, but thy commandment is exceeding broad. You see how that relates to the subject at hand? Could you explain, please? Thy commandment is exceeding broad, meaning. It includes a lot more than you think it does. Right? So, to take the name of God in vain. Most people, what do most people think about that? At least if you're in the Southern Baptist Church that I grew up in, what do they think? What does it mean to take the name of God in vain? Britain. What do they think of? You know, I'm not sure about this one. I don't, I'm not, I don't know much about they, that. Well, hey, oh boy, are you, boy, are you blessed. <laughs> they think of taking God's name in vain, something like blurting out Jesus Christ, right? Or blurting out GD. Um, that's what they think it is. And it's basically limited to that. But it includes a lot more than you think it does, like we were just talking about. The F-bomb. You're taking God's name in vain every time you do that because God is a God of a covenant. Hey, your country even helps you to understand that, but you're too stupid to ask questions. Did you know this? Listen to this, guys. I have asked about 20, 25 people in China, what year is this? And they say 2019. My next question, where did that number come from? How come it's not 325? Guess what? Nobody knows. Nobody knows what 2019 came from. And they write it every day just like you do. Haven't got a clue. And when you tell them where 2019 came from, what's their reaction? What do you think it is, Jake? Uh, they probably think that's, that's a silly... That's a silly... Hey, that's a, you know? <sighs> Okay, next, yeah. next, yeah. the most important date in history, why did they choose, and this is what I always tell them, how come they didn't choose your birthday, how come they didn't choose my birthday, because you're not important enough, <laughs> you're nothing, <laughs> he's everything and you're nothing, that's what you mean every time you write that number down, so, anyway, all profaning and abusing of anything whereby God making himself known. We're going to spend the rest of the time just thinking about his attributes as listed in question number four. What's that? Jamie, you know that. What is God? Tell us. Um, God is a spirit, infinite, eternal, and... Unchangeable. Unchangeable. And his, and his being, wisdom, power... Holiness. Holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. There you go. Or, I think it would be better, and it is stated this way in Chinese. Um, God is, in His, being wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. Infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. That makes it much clearer to me anyway. God is. In His being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. In all of these attributes. He's infinite. He's eternal. 
and unchangeable in these attributes. There's no end of these attributes. You can think of, just as, a, uh, as we just read, Psalm 119, 96. Thy commandment is exceeding broad, and his attributes are exceeding the meditation. In his law does he meditate day and night. That's, that's not just talking about the Ten Commandments meditating. In his, in his law, his, 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 um, the road of, of God's being. In other words, the, the way of thinking about God. There's no end to it. Eternal. It never ends. All of these attributes. God is not going to cease to be holy one day. Etc. And unchangeable. He's not going to become suddenly less holy or less good or less wise. So, first of all, his being. What is it to reverence God's being? What would you say? Kenneth. <laughs> well, give me just one thing about it. Well, well thank you. At the very least, appreciate the antithesis uh, between his being and yours that uh, you are finite. There you go. There you go. Uh, you think of Exodus 3, right? When Moses says to God, When I go to the people of Israel and they ask me, Who is it that sent you? What should I tell them your name is? And what does he say? I am that I am. That is what it means to reverence the being of God. He is the being from which all being comes. Think of the ramifications of that thought. Kenneth, just name one or two out of two trillion. Huh? There you go. Your breathing comes from his being. Right? Your seeing. Remember, it says, Shall he that made the eye not see? Think about that. You're talking, that's just like in said. This is overload stuff. This is, once again, meditation. On the attributes of God. So, but what about the unbeliever? What does he think about the being of God? Jake. Well, the uh, secularist thinks we either can't know it or it doesn't exist. Yeah. He thinks nothing of the being. Nothing! He's totally depraved. He thinks so... His... Thinking of God is such nothingness that it's backwards. He's got to go forward just to get to zero. Think about that. Being wisdom. What about the wisdom of God? How important is that? How do people violate the wisdom of God? Think about that one. Jake, what would you say? Because we're talking about taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. What is prohibited? All profaning and abusing of anything whereby God making himself known. He makes him known himself known by his wisdom. And yeah. think, let's meditate on this. What is it that scripture tells us that most manifests the wisdom of God? And you got and you got a, your object of meditation. What is it that most manifests or most clearly manifests the wisdom of God? His moral law, his law. His gospel. The answer, okay, hello, the answer to this question, how can a man be just with God, right? Seeing with emphasis on the then, Kenneth, why is there emphasis on the then? How then can a man be just with God? Seeing the law to be its uh, reach, um, how can I... Uh, who am a violator of the whole law by nature? 
answer, not be damned. There it is. And the answer to that question reveals to you, because as a natural man, um, th that is so far from your understanding, that's why the, the purpose of the question, how then can I be so, it's impossible. No, it would be impossible if it depended on anything in you, but God has found a way in his wisdom to give you the answer to that question, which is what? Gary. What's the answer to that question which takes the wisdom of God? How can a man be just with God? What's the answer? You could never figure it out. I could never figure it out. What? Right. He sent Christ who was perfect God and perfect man. He had to be God to, come to, to pay an infinite penalty for sin. He had to be man because it was man that sinned, etc. And on and on and on throughout all eternity. Being wisdom... Power. What is it to reverence the power of God? Jamie. When we speak of the power of God, we're talking about omnipotence. Where is that most clearly seen? Jamie. I'm not sure. You know, you remember, remember that story of footprints in the sand. <laughs> when I was in the Baptist church you know that story don't you the footprints in the sand Heidi remember that one huh Heidi wait I have to get to the mic yes sir I do <laughs> okay tell us about tell us about the foot the footprints in the sand there's another one but for in the sand. <laughs> we don't want to hear that one. <laughs> What's the footprints in the sand story? Oh, uh, that God's carrying us. Yeah, they, they, that, in other words, the person says, Oh, Jesus, and I was so, I was so depressed, and I was so crestfallen and downtrodden, and... and how come? There were two sets of footprints in the sand and then I saw only one set of footprints in the sand. How come? How come you left me and I was the only one with footprints? <laughs> and, then, and what did Jesus, what did Jesus say? Larry, have you heard the story? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> what was the answer? Huh? Jesus is that's where that's where I picked you up. And as if he had not been carrying you throughout all the, throughout any thoughts of you. So we're talking about the omnipotence of what what does that consist in? Jamie. The most important aspect of his omnipotence. What is it? Well, whenever I think of his omnipotence, I think of creation. Right. Which is a metaphor for the most important. What is it, Kenneth? Were you about to say the most important aspect of the omnipotence of God and Jamie mentioned creation, which is very important. But creation is only important as it manifests God's omnipotence as it is, it is a metaphor for what? For the new creation. There you go. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. Darkness depends on you to know what it is. <laughs> Think about that. Huh? Has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Think of the omnipotence it takes to take somebody like you and cause you to believe that it is God who is to be glorified and not you. 
All the Arminians believe it's you and not God. All the Calvinists believe it's you and not God. The difference between a Calvinist and an Arminian is the Calvinist just knows how to tangle it up a little bit better. With being wisdom, power, holiness. What about that one? Jake. God. Or to respect it, yeah. Well, um, I think to uh, one, of, one of the ways that the holiness of God is profaned is that uh, uh, His holiness isn't respected in worship, in, for one thing, in, in, a lot, in a lot of churches anyway. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they approach Him any old way they want to. Well, remember, we preached a sermon on the word Emmanuel. What a beautiful word that is. When I was a kid, um, we were told, Emmanuel, God with us. That was about it. Emmanuel, God with us. It sort of gives you a touchy-feely, tingling sort of feeling, God with us. But it is the idea, first of all, of the L, God as judge. And then the, 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 the transcendent one. And God is transcendent uh, in the, so far as He is creator and we are createe. And from a natural, in a natural sense, what could be more uh, a clear expression of the transcendence? Of, but we're not speaking of the natural realm, we're speaking of the spiritual realm. How is it that God is infinitely transcendent? Kenneth. In the spiritual realm. In the natural realm, hey, how could he be more transcendent than the fact that he he's outside of us because he created us? But in the spiritual realm, what is it? In the spiritual realm, God is transcendent in the sense that he is thrice holy and can have uh, no fellowship at all with sin or sinners. There it is right there. So if you don't believe that, you are by nature profaning the holiness of God. How can He have anything to do with you? There it is. Being wisdom, power, holiness, justice. What about that one? What is it to respect the justice of God? Compare that with the Arminian. Jamie, what does the Arminian think about the justice of God? I'm not sure. Well, what does he say that Christ, for whom did Christ die? Ask the guy at the football game when the sign's up. Huh? For whom did Christ die? What does he say? I don't know. The Armenian? Yeah. I, he says sure. everybody. He says Jesus oh. died for everybody. And what's my next question? <laughs> what's it always going to be? I say so. Since Jesus died for everybody, so that means that everybody's going to go to heaven, right? And what's his answer? Kenneth? His answer is no. No! Because what? Because not everybody, put a number of ways, not everybody places their faith. Right, and not everybody believes in Jesus. What has he, what has he just done? He's trampled on the justice of God. It means nothing to him. And what does it mean? When you explain to him that, wait a second, if Jesus died and paid the penalty of every sin that every person ever committed, then what must happen? Larry. If Jesus died and paid the penalty for every sin that every person who ever lived ever committed, what cannot possibly happen to that person if God is just? Then he won't go to heaven. Exactly. He won't go to hell if, God, if Christ right. Yeah. Yeah. And after you explain that to him, what does he say? Huh? I don't know. 
He says the same thing. It means nothing to him. It, it, I remember when I was an Arminian, I thought that free will was the most logical thing on earth. And it, it's the exact opposite. There's nothing more insane than, than, than the doctrine of free will. Being wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness. What is it? To believe in the goodness of God. To reverence the goodness of God. What do you think, Gary? Well, I think it's, yeah, right. You can't separate it. God is good to Himself, first of all, first and foremost. And then, He is good to the elect, only in so far. This, was, this, this one is really particularly vast, and, uh, well, they all are, uh, and deep. God is first and foremost good to himself and he's good to his elect in so far as he is good to himself because he's got an everlasting eternal plan to glorify himself in the salvation of his people. And then the last thing is truth. What does it mean to, to respect the uh, truth of God? Jake. The veracity. That's a good word. Jake, lick your mic. Josh, this thing. Okay, it's to uh, assent to it. To believe in it. Yeah. But, but what is it to believe in it? To believe in the truth of God and the veracity of God. It is to... Um, yeah, and, and think about think about the both the Armenian expression and the Calvinistic expression of what they believe. Both of them. Um, put it this way: everything they believe, it really is this serious. Everything they believe manifests their determination not to believe that God is going to do what He said He's going to do. Right? Kenneth, what do I mean by that? Um, well, put it, let, me, let me make it clearer. Uh, what did God say He's going to do? Right, and he's going to damn certain individuals owing to, not simply what, owing to who they are. So both the Arminian and the Calvinist believe that what is the Calvinist communicating when he says total depravity does not mean that the sinner is as bad as he can be. That is denying the truth of God. Because they're bound and determined to say what? Kenneth. Uh, they're, they're bound and, and determined to keep people from seeing Christ right. by keeping them in their belief in their own self-righteousness. Yeah, but with respect to the truth of God, they're bound and determined to say that God's a liar because man is not as bad as he can be. Because God cannot possibly hate the sinner himself. That's impossible. No. And so they come up with all these shenanigans. Monkey business, as somebody called it. Because they deny the veracity of God. So when you come to the scripture, to believe in the truth of God is to say this. I don't know anything, right? But what do they do? All their exegesis is what? Kenneth. Exegesis. Yeah, every last bit of it. They come to Scripture. And if you're, you're talking about an Armenian or a they come to Scripture with their preconceived notions and then what do they do? Read them into the Scripture. 
denying the truth of God. Let's pray and then we'll do let's pray and then we'll do our catechism. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for that word. For that word and all the gloriousness of it. The way that thou hast manifest thyself to us. The all profaning and abusing of anything whereby God maketh himself known. We thank thee that thou hast made thyself known so clearly in the scriptures. And though we by nature have denied every single aspect of thy clear manifestation, thou hast overcome our unbelief. Thou hast enlightened us, caused us not only to respect thy name, but to glory in it. In the name of the Lord Jesus we pray. Amen.